Whether you'd like to admit it or not, your back is the foundation to your physique. So how do we build it? We're going to take the most scientific approach possible, targeting each section of the back with a workout specifically tailored to elicit maximum stimulation. Because far too many of you don't understand just how important this is to your overall physique. So let me ask you this. What gives you that superhero look? Arms, chest, abs? You gotta be fucking kidding me. One of the most popular questions I get asked is just how did you build your back? The simple answer is a combination of consistency, progressive overload, and above all else, a good training program. Because without this, the first two are essentially useless. There's no point in being consistent and progressively getting stronger in a program that simply doesn't work. In this video, the main indicator of how good an exercise is will be its ability to stimulate the target muscle. Studies have been conducted using electromyography or EMG experiments where individuals perform exercises with electrodes situated on the target muscles. Electrical impulses which stimulate our muscles to contract can be read by these electrodes and measured to determine specifically which exercises are most efficient at recruiting the target muscle and providing the best possible workout. The deadlift is the king of all exercises. It is one of the biggest compound lifts you could possibly do, and nine times out of 10, it is the most amount of weight you have ever held in your hands. Although the deadlift greatly involves the glutes and hamstrings, it draws a significant amount of its power from the back as well. There's a bit of controversy as to whether the deadlift should be included on back or leg days. However, due to its lack of quadricep involvement, I advocate performing this lift on back or pull days. Seeing as for most of you, this may be one of your strongest lifts, there are issues with grip or the bar simply slipping out of your hands. However, there are a few ways to counteract this. Firstly, chalk, a simple and cheap way to significantly increase friction between the hands and the bar. An alternated grip where one hand is over the bar and the other one is under as opposed to a double overhand grip. The only issue with this is that it puts your body into an asymmetrical stance. So I only advocate using this when you get to weights that are significantly heavy and you can no longer use double overhand grip. Wrist straps, very effective when you get to a point where your back can provide sufficient force to move the bar, however your hands simply cannot keep up. This simply takes them out of the equation. Some key points to focus on with regards to the deadlift. Start with the bar directly over the middle of your feet. Pull the slack out of the bar prior to commencing the lift. Activate your lats, but leave your scapula in a neutral position. Do not worry about getting your hips too low. The deadlift is not a squat. Pull the bar as close to your body as possible. I personally wear leggings because they provide protection for my shins and they make my ass look damn good. About halfway through the lift, engage your glutes as much as possible, trying to bring them forward into the bar. When it comes to the deadlift, the primary muscle groups activated in your back are your lats, erector spinae, and even your traps to a lesser extent. In addition, the rear deltoids and countless other small stabilizer muscles are involved. Four sets of six reps is a very good starting point. Moving into our isolation exercises, now it's time to focus more so on muscle contraction and overall time under tension. Lifting heavy weight is important, but it's the tension and stress placed on each individual muscle fiber which induces hypertrophy, otherwise known as muscle growth. Although there are multiple variations of how to perform the pull-up, such as an underhand grip, narrow grip, etc., according to the EMG data, a shoulder width overhand grip produces the most muscle fiber activation. When it comes to the pull-up, the primary muscle group activated is your lats. 
I recommend four sets of eight to 12 reps. However, if you are not strong enough to perform the minimum eight reps, most gyms have assisted pull-up machines, which allow you to pull less than your body weight with the assistance of a counterweight. As you get stronger, use less and less counterweight until you are able to do standard bodyweight pull-ups. On the other hand, if you find yourself able to easily perform the required 12 reps and more for all four sets, it's time to start doing weighted pull-ups. This can be done by holding a small dumbbell in between your feet or using a weighted pull-up slash dip belt with a chain as shown here. As the name implies, pull-ups are an example of a pulling movement, whereas dumbbell rows is the first rowing exercise in your workout. To build a great back, you need a combination of both types of movements. The primary muscle group activated in dumbbell rows are your lats, and to a smaller extent, your rhomboids, a small muscle group responsible for attracting the scapula. Use an underhand grip, keeping your arms close to your torso. Make sure not to twist your torso. Imagine there is an invisible wall up against your back and the only joints involved in the movement are your shoulder and elbow. An optional form tweak is to twist the dumbbell and perform the lift with your palms facing the front as opposed to facing you. In the EMG data, this resulted in 6% more muscle activation in your lats as opposed to the standard palms facing you. However, the twist this places on your forearm can be uncomfortable for some individuals, so that is why it is entirely optional. Like in the pull-ups, four sets of eight to 12 reps should be more than sufficient. Similar to the pull-ups, as the name implies, lat pull-downs target your lats, aka your latissimus dorsi. The only difference is that instead of pulling your body weight up, you're pulling a weight down. This makes this exercise extremely useful for individuals who may not be able to do body weight pull-ups. It is excellent for beginners, overweight individuals, women, pretty much anybody. Perform the exercise with a shoulder width overhand grip, bringing the bar down to your sternum. At the bottom of the movement, at the peak point of contraction, you want to visualize your elbows retracting so far back that they actually touch. Obviously this is not possible, but just having this mental cue allows you to get maximum activation of the lats. EMG data has shown that you can get 11% more muscle activation by having a slight bend in your body. This means instead of sitting perfectly straight up, you want to bend your torso back about 10 to 20 degrees and pull the bar both down and into you. Perform four sets of eight to 12 reps, focusing on maximum muscle contraction and time under tension. Ideally, this exercise is performed with a V-bar or handle. Similar to dumbbell rows, this exercise activates your lats, rhomboids, and even your rear deltoids somewhat. Do not use momentum in this exercise, swinging your back forwards and backwards as you pull the weight and thus reducing the force required from your back. A huge point to remember is the degree to which you flare out your elbows. If they are flared out at approximately a 45 degree angle from your body, this is a difference of less than 1% when it comes to muscle activation in comparison to keeping them tucked in. However, a 90% angle where your elbows essentially make a big T with your torso, this reduces target muscle activation by a stunning 49%. Do not do this. Normally, after completing two pull-down and rowing exercises, most of your back has gotten sufficient stimulation. The final muscle group left to focus on is the trapezius. You can build your back up to 220 pounds at 8% body fat, but if you don't have a decent set of traps, you will always look like a pencil neck 12-year-old boy waiting for puberty to kick in. There are technically multiple portions and segments to the trapezius, so we will incorporate two exercises to target most of these. Dumbbell shrugs are an excellent exercise for the upper portion of the traps. I personally prefer them to barbell shrugs because you aren't forced to pronate your hands in front of you and you can keep them at your sides in a more neutral position. Make sure to choose a weight which allows you to get maximal contraction and even hold for a quick one or two seconds at the top of the movement. The final exercise in our workout, the reverse pec deck, focuses on the medial portion of the trapezius in addition to your rear deltoids. The involvement of the rear deltoids in so many of these back exercises is the reason why I chose to not exercise rear deltoids on shoulder day as they get more than enough stimulation in this workout. Keep your arms out at roughly 90 degrees and pull back until your scapula is fully retracted. Four sets, eight to 12 reps. In conclusion, the last point to keep in mind throughout this entire workout is weight selection. Always up for a weight which allows you to complete the desired rep range with full range of motion safely. If you find yourself falling short on the minimum reps required or using things like momentum or alternative muscle groups to help you finish the reps, the weight is simply too much. Leave your ego at the door, drop the weight, focus on time under tension, and simply put, don't train like an idiot.
But remember, any work type program, no matter how advanced, will be absolutely useless when not executed in conjunction with a proper diet. Guys, if you're tired of screwing around in the gym and simply not looking the way you want, you can always hire me as your one-on-one -on -one coach for a science-based approach to get you where you want to be. But in the meantime, follow this routine and train like a beast, eat like a beast, and you'll look like, well, you get the picture.